Hello, welcome to the Urban Manifesto. The COVID-19 crisis is one of the biggest challenges we have faced as humanity in over a century. It's a health, economic, and social crisis all rolled into one. And as we get used to this new normal, we, we have an opportunity to break from the unsustainable and unhealthy patterns of the pre-COVID era and reimagine a new world. We believe cities are a crucial tool to enable inclusive, sustainable, and happier world. They're really key to solving some of the greatest challenges that we face from environmental degradation to poverty. In the Urban Manifesto series, we lay out detailed plans for better urban futures. I am Pratima Manohar. I'm the founder of the Urban Vision, and I'm thrilled to bring this series to you along with my colleague, Lucy Bullivant. We would both like to welcome all our viewers from around the world. Uh, and we are hosting this as part of Architecture Foundation's 100 Day Studio. Thank you so much for joining us. Lucy? Thank you so much, Prathima, and uh, welcome to everybody uh, watching today. Today's webinar theme is Streets as Places of Commerce and Culture, hybrid theme. Now, you know and I know that public streets are places of startling episodes of liberation, demonstration, unspeakable stories of oppression, tragedy, and homelessness. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we also know that in the pandemic, a huge number of retail businesses are under huge financial strain. And uh, this is um, something that uh, undeniably, yet public streets have indomitable potential and they deserve to revive as critically valuable expressive arenas showcasing the best of uh, the human spirit and creativity, places to see and be seen in, celebrate and congregate, interact and share, places where interactive, uh, inclusive local culture and commerce can be nurtured. And it's this imperative to overcome changes and challenges and build uh, streets identities as locally sustainable places, breaking with past formulas and ways of doing things to explicitly enable social value that we're focusing on this week. So I'm delighted to welcome our two guests. Um, on our right, we have Rohit Shinkre, who's an architect with his own practice in Mumbai, founded in 1996, and the principal of Roshana mm -hmm. Sansad's Academy of Architecture in, in the city there. And on the left side of the screen is Adam Walker, who founded Crate, based in the UK. He's an entrepreneur who's launching his own uh, new uh, next mission, Reimagining Places, in September at the London Real Estate Forum. So, um, guys, before we kick off with um, your your three minute manifesto, first of all, I would like to um, ask you how are you are both do each of you do been doing in the lockdown? Adam, maybe you answer first. Well, I'm I'm really enjoying my um my my uh, my break my mini break. Um, the weather's helping. I hope that the weather carries on like it has been, but um. Yeah, it's uh, it's been testing, challenging. Homeschooling is is all new. I have an incredible uh, respect for teachers now, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a, a very interesting time for for many of us. So um, you have to take the positives from it. Yeah, that's um, undoubtedly the case. So Rohit, how have you been faring? Oh, uh, pretty. Okay. I mean, Mumbai has had its. Uh, I mean, it's right. It's still not out of danger. We are still on the edge of things, uh, on the brink of things to explode. But the experience has been uh, very interesting. I mean, uh, we have seen the city. I've never seen the city the way I've seen it in the last 15 days. Come totally quiet and uh, noiseless, and so it's 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 been a completely 
surreal kind of I mean, to uh, to be in, to be in a known environment in a completely different, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a completely different dimension. That almost so it's almost like being in a movie, you know. <laughs> so, so because quietness is not something that you associate with Mumbai. So it's been a long time that uh, last almost two and a half months. Mm. There's no honking on the street. There are no crowds. There's a, so it's it's a completely different environment. It's as if you were in some other part of the world. Uh, otherwise, work-wise, it's mostly been the the college work that has been made, keeping us busy because we are we have to teach online now next year. So a lot of changes in the the way we're going to organize ourselves. So that has taken a lot of the effort. Uh, work-wise, in the studio is it's kind of happening at a at a leisurely pace, so which is also appreciated. <laughs> yeah, everybody's had to go through absolutely unprecedented amount of adaptation into their mm. lives very, very quickly, mm. and does the huge amount. It's quite a heavy thing to process. So, yes. um, thank you. Um, so, central to our Urban Manifesto series is inviting our speakers each week to share their three pressing absolutely top priority headline points of their own manifesto relating to the theme. Um, and then Prathima and I then go on to draw them out further through some questions. So today, uh, responding to streets as places of commerce and culture, we're asking Adam and Rohit hit one by one to share their manifestos. So Adam, over to you. Well, brilliant. Um, so we've got our slide, super, thank you, Lucy. So this is, a, this is a, an example of a meanwhile project that um, was a public-private sector partnership between the London borough of Waltham Forest and Crate. And this was a really important piece of and economic development and narrative uh, change for uh, what is a quite difficult part of, of North London, North East London. So we, our challenge here was to reset an area, the narrative of an area which has had its fair share of problems, um, drugs and social behavior, murder, knife crime, and create a new place that would bring the community back onto the streets to make them feel safe. And I think if we were to flip to the next slide, the location of this particular site at, at the, the end of Walthamstow High Street, which is Europe's longest um, market high street. So it's got that claim to fame. And this public-private sector partnership was, was challenging. They all are, obviously, in different ways. But this was an example of a public body working closely with the private sector business to deliver a scheme and and it was it was actually slightly shorter but it, but it was effectively a two year from meeting to delivery and um Crate St James Street in Walthamstow has been open a year now it had its first birthday yesterday and the outcomes from from that particular intervention which is a meanwhile scheme it's a five-year use there's a disused car park outside of an overgrown station. The outcomes really come from the tight curation of the scheme, which I think is the third slide. By curation, we mean and it's all about the slide and that Is I think we are having uh, an issue with Adam's audio. Yeah, maybe Adam can call back in again. Is it a signal issue? Adam, are you here? I think his screen's frozen again. Oh. 
again. Hello. Hello. Hi. He's back. Are you back? Sorry. Um, I just closing slide. Um, Keep going. Over. Here we go. Imagination closing slide. So this this was a fire. Um, a, a disuse. Um, exact. Oh. Spaces in the end. So. Okay, I think his voice is completely breaking. Yeah. Should we? Uh, I don't know. Should we log back in because we can't hear you at all. Your voice is breaking a ton. Maybe you should try your uh, cell phone and try to log in through that. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask uh, Rohit to state your three-point manifesto uh, when we reimagine streets as places of culture and uh, commerce. Rohit? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the first uh, uh, point in my manifesto would be to recognize that uh, cities are a place of exchange. And currently, the land use based urbanism or urban planning that we are subscribing to actually doesn't recognize many kinds of exchanges that are legitimate. In a city like Mumbai, these exchanges represent 68% of livelihoods. And it is really the deep grassroots economy that keeps the city and even the city going. Uh, so, and I think supporting that economy is is uh, is is our best bet to to uh, to address urban poverty. Uh, there is a lot done to address the organized uh, economy, which we know and which is required. I'm not saying that uh, that needs to be ignored, but at the same time, uh, equal attention, if not more attention, uh, uh, due to the sheer scale, has to be uh, awarded to the grassroots economy that that uh, uh, that really is uh, concerning the majority of our people and and as things i mean the other positives is that uh, it's an economy which is extremely local uh, it's uh, and it will it's in the direction of the low carbon economy that the, the entire globe is trying to uh, move towards so uh, the, the even more reasons to kind of support that. That will be the first point. This the second point would be actually more to the to the kind of architectural typologies that are emerging now. Uh, I mean, we see uh, across the world uh, buildings being developed on top of parking podiums, large gated communities. So basically, the 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 kind of living edge that the buildings you know, uh, used to offer to the city earlier is now becoming inert, you know, parking lots and utilities and compound walls. So uh, so what used to be uh, very vibrant neighborhoods, vibrant communities is uh, becoming uh, just blank walls. I mean, sometimes those walls are, are uh, the kind of medium to do some fantastic formal work for architects, but I don't think that's enough to kind of uh, to, to really liven up uh, the streetscapes and the city life. So I think we have to be careful about the kind of architectural uh, typologies that uh, that seem convenient, but uh, which are, uh, I think, uh, killing the, the, the lives of our streets. And my Thank last you. point would be oh, yes, right. my last point would be that I think design and planning have a role to play in in uh, in uh, in, the, in managing the uh, urban space a little differently. Uh, there are various claims on that uh, public space. People need to drive their cars. Public transport needs to run. Emergency services need to run. But there is also a whole lot of other things that uh, that are happening in those streets and for which these streets are probably not designed for. So what I'm showing you right now is, is, a, is a range of street furniture that we had proposed for the city of Mumbai, uh, which was basically a, a modular system which, which could 
kind of adapt and evolve to uh, serve various purposes from simple uh, crowd management to benches to to uh, advertising supports to uh, to little cupboards in which hawkers uh, and street vendors could uh, uh, could do their business and uh, it kind of kept their presence on the streets uh, organized it in a in a way that uh, they uh, they could continue working uh, without uh, uh, reducing their impact on the general flow of traffic and pedestrian movement so the idea was to use design to drive that kind of a consensus between the various users of public space great fantastic thank you shall we try going back to adam adam how are you doing i'm here yeah i think we got how many yeah we got two thirds through the way or halfway through have another bash at it yeah, so um, we, we we think did we get to the curation piece, which was the um, the tenant mix, which is slide uh, slide three, I think. Um, so public private sector partnerships. So we've got curation mix. So really important piece of of the story, the the physical intervention of the people, the businesses, the entrepreneurs that uh, the, the early adopters in these um, in these meanwhile schemes. And this this meanwhile scheme was about so much more than just building a structure on a car park to activate or reactivate a high street. This was about um, creating community focus. This was about litmus testing workspace um, for the future developments that are coming along. So this is very much just strategic intervention um, from the local authorities' perspective as well, from an economic development perspective. But very quickly, a heavily curated environment, so cross sector, cross life stage, a mix of retail services, well-being businesses and some food and beverage for the nighttime economy and 600 businesses inquired for 34 spaces on on this particular project so it really proved that the the, the, the micro enterprise the msmes are, are in the in the suburbs in the suburban capitals of london are desperate for decent space and there is a there is a real lack of provision in the suburbs um, that's um, that's really insightful. Thanks, Adam. Um, I mean, I met you when you were working on that project with the London Borough of Waltham Forest, and uh, I met a few of the early adopters who were involved in the crate project and over a drink and chat with you and uh, and them. You um, obviously you were trying from the very beginning to reinvent the retail rule book as you always favoured doing. Uh, what kind of um, uh, insights do you gain from the early adopters, all told? You know, and what what about the feedback that they gave you makes you feel that you would do something similar again in the future or uh, adapt your your strategy? What kind of feedback did you get from the local authority about what you've achieved, and uh, what kind of input did they make to help you? Sure. Well, I think I think. Um... You know, critically, whether it's the tenants in the business or the local community, all the stakeholders, um, it started out with engagement, 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 consultant, um, public consultation, and then blood, sweat, and tears to deliver it. Um, the, 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 the interesting feedback from the MSME perspective, and this goes sort of across the board, across other crate sites as well, is that it's, it's the platform, it's the soft approach to, to supporting the businesses so it's facilitating um, the business along there it's not um, not getting in their businesses it's very much nudging the um, the, the, the the SMEs the, the entrepreneurs along the local authority um, who London Borough Hall from Forest who were incredibly uh, supportive of the delivery of this scheme and and uh, I do a, a lot of uh, talks with, with the guys at, at, at London Borough of Forest, which were Borough of Culture last year, London Mayor mm. Borough of Culture. Um, they, those guys, the, the outcomes for, for the local authority in the community, of course, are were focused initially around um, improving, can you hear me, Keep going in and out, in, in, improving and adding confidence back into that high street which was referred to as the bottom of Walthamstow market 
and I, I've you know tried desperately hard to to, to shake that um, bottom of the market to the start of the market. Mm. Um, and, and I think that the the the, the real the real outcome from its first year has been a success in the in the businesses that have been there and the adoption and the commitment from the local community who have been massively supportive of the scheme who use the scheme whether it's to have dresses altered whether it's to have a website built they're coming in for a beer and a pizza um, it's become a real it's become a real community asset of months. I just quickly wanted to perhaps point out to audience who people, members who are not going to be aware of that, Adam, of course, which was the larger picture, which is there is uh, there's new housing just literally round the corner from that back off the high street. And uh, I think when I spoke to you, you were saying that it, it was what you were creating was a real asset for those housing developers who would otherwise uh, then have to go ahead and create something like that from scratch, wouldn't they? Um, and so by you applying this bespoke approach, it's much more effective. Absolutely. It's, it's the activator. Yeah. Um, the activator. Um, it's a good word, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. 3,000 units, resi units being built within a very close proximity of hmm. St. James Court, St. James Street, Black Horse Road, this end of B17 over the next few years. And uh, the activator on the car park at St. James Street was... was, was uh, this is very much a strategic play. It's a place, a narrative play. Um, but it's the community. And when you're building that much resi, community must come with. And, and it's great to see a community going in early rather than after the fact. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's all, it's all about... It's all about strategy of adapted, uh, adaptability but strategy and what comes first, like you need to have transport infrastructure if you're going to have a hope of doing a good new mixed use neighborhood. So we turn to Rohit. Rohit, um, you created this really interesting, very, very well written hawkers policy for street trading in Mumbai six years ago and in response to the national legislation in India for the right to livelihood all Indian cities had to make provision for, recognizing the social economic importance of street trading. Um, in it, it, you have a lot of really, really fine uh, planning and design propositions. And the point you were making about um, architecture being as important for the whole business of managing and planning space, uh, the art of organization, you, you know, uh, it, it's really, really important. So I'm interested to know how many of your propositions in the policy have actually been implemented or do you feel have influenced people across uh, India? Uh, I mean, actual implementation is, uh, I mean, we, we did this for the, uh, the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai. So we were hoping that they would implement it in some places. Uh, we still hope they would. Yeah. Uh, but I think that the, the, the the, the implementation is 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 a is a very complex uh, situation because uh, not that the, the designs or the proposals were not uh, not appreciated but the it kind of questions a whole lot of things within the the way the municipal authorities uh, and local urban governments work i mean uh, to kind of illustrate very clearly the, the department within the uh, Mumbai municipality that deals with the hawking licenses and the department that actually manages the public uh, space, the pavements, the roads, the urban furniture, etc. are completely different. They don't speak to each other. So uh, for, a, for a proposal like this to, 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 to be implemented, it would be first required that the way in which these departments work, they understand that their work is actually interrelated, that they cannot keep working in in uh, in silos, saying that we take care of the licensing the uh, the hawkers mm -hmm. and somebody else takes care of of uh, managing the the, uh, the the public domain. So I think so. The implementation is is uh, is uh, is is a little bit of a, a, a very slow process. But I'm still happy that we got an opportunity to, to do this because I think through the interaction we have had with the with the city authorities, 
I think there's at least a change in the way they 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 have themselves started looking at uh, the uh, the public domain and at street vending, uh, mm -hmm. because I think one of the biggest problem is is the problem of perspective. I mean, we have always looked at street vending as some kind of a uh, you know uh, malign growth happening <laughs> within within the city, and I think it's important yeah. to completely change that perspective. Really look at it as 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 a boon i mean uh, as, as as something that is uh, uh, providing decent livelihood honest livelihood to a lot of people who otherwise will be unemployed and probably rioting you know <laughs> so so uh, so uh, i think we have to recognize the, the the social and the economic value of the service they are providing and they also exist because uh, they offer some kind of convenience and some kind of value to a lot of citizens of, of the city as well. So they are not existing in isolation. They are, So mm -hmm. they are definitely not a burden or something that we need to uh, wish away. I think uh, the, that change in perspective is important. And I think our work has mm -hmm. uh, contributed a little bit towards that. Uh, I mean, we have since then been called by the city authorities to do some other public space projects. And, uh, and we do have this in the back of our minds. We every time able to table this, we always try and do that so that uh, it, it, it's not forgotten. <laughs> yeah, I hear you very well. I think that this is fundamentally about, in essence, about destigmatizing the, uh, the, 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 the street traders' role within society. And uh, yeah. if that can be, you know, the empowerment of the street trader, if that can be, uh, can be done, through various means, then that's at the, uh, at the heart of it. And it leads very nicely on to um, Prathama's question about inclusive economic growth. Yeah, I, I think on that note, you know, we all will agree that inclusive economic growth is one of the most crucial agendas uh, for the future. I think we've seen how this pandemic has ripped through and amplified how unequal our world is, whether you're in an uh, emerging uh, world economy like us here in India, or, you know, if you're in New York or London, you know, all of us are seeing the fractures uh, in our society that this pandemic is, in a way has highlighted the inequities in our society. And I think all of us will agree that the road to recovery should be based on inclusion and that's crucial for a healthier, happier society. Um, and, you know, the work that you both do is crucial to that road to recovery. The idea of inclusive development is about empowering local businesses and micro entrepreneurs like the street vendors, the SMEs and the micro entrepreneurs or the artisans that, um, you know, that become the community and ecosystem of your physical uh, infrastructure. And, you know, we are now in a way in the era of deglobalization. The world seems to be uh, moving towards localization and uh, both your uh, work empower that idea of local entrepreneurship, um, you know, authentic, lo authentic local cultures and businesses. Adam, your work has, uh, in a way, work, you know, focused on entrepreneurial activities and enabling startups and micro businesses um, and creating work-live neighborhoods, which uh, are crucial for economic growth. Uh, how do you view inclusive growth and how do you, uh, in a way, enable this within through your work and projects? Adam? Yeah, well, I, I think it's a great question. I think it couldn't be more relevant. Um, we, I think the, the interesting thing about um, any, any, any design pre-pandemic uh, of a structure of a platform uh, clearly has to be looked at, whether it's uh, retail, whether it's uh, um, workspace, flex space, whatever it might be, um, residential. I think there's a really, really interesting time in our lives now for change, and there's a great opportunity to hit the circuit breaker, so to speak. Mm. Um, with regards 
inclusivity, and and I think that's at the centre of, of 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 everything that that um that I've ever done um in in the from a design perspective and from a curation perspective, because I've always believed in 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 the sites to be inclusive not exclusive to be outwardly facing um so that the businesses don't feel as if they're in the cheap seats um and it's really really important from a, a micro sme from any background from an entrepreneur from any background to feel part of something bigger in in a scenario where nobody wins unless everybody wins um and that's something that that, that i've always done um with uh, with crate and before crate and will do post crate as well um, but but it, essentially, I think it's 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 um, it's never been so apparent, um, and I think this this time in our lives that we have now to um, to do something about it, we, we we've got to grab it, and we've got to run with it, and, and we've got to ensure that economic development teams in local authorities globally um, are are in tune and are relevant. No, that's such a um, great point to make. Um, nobody wins unless everybody wins. And I think, uh, like you said, that message has never been more important as we see this pandemic ripping through our societies and economies. Rohit, you're, uh, you know, in India, a large part of our uh, workforce, almost 82% of our workforce is in the informal sector. And as we uh, reopen our economies, uh, one of the crucial agendas for uh, the COVID recovery plan uh, is this whole new um, mantra that our prime minister seems to have about a vocal for local program with a focus on self-sufficiency, especially at the bottom of the pyramid. Now, these are all very shiny you know, words for PR campaign. <laughs> but what, you know, do you think obviously this idea of empowering grassroots economy uh, is the best bet for uh, tackling poverty? And uh, how do you move from the mantra to action? The, you know, from the dictum of political campaigns to real work on ground, how, what are the things we need to do to, enable inclusive uh, economic growth to play out? Uh, and how do you see that in the work that you do, which is enabling the informal, um, you know, communities in our city, you know, the food entrepreneurs, the artisans? Um, yeah. How do we, what kind of things should we be doing to uh, unleash this energy? Yeah. So uh, one is what I already said. One is about uh, looking at uh, the, that entire grassroots economy in a positive way. The second is to change our system so that we are more uh, receptive and more uh, attentive to how they function. I mean, I always remember this really remarkable quote by Mohammed Yunus, who you know was a Nobel uh, laureate. Uh, in economics a few years ago and he was the inventor of what they call microcredit now and he had said that it's not the people who need to be credit worthy it is it's the banks who need to be people worthy so i think right now our the, uh, our entire institutional setup i mean whether it's private sector whether it's government this entire uh, sea of people uh, in street vendors, rack pickers, so many other participants in the informal economy uh, are completely in a blind spot. Uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, the way forward would be to actually see how institutions could could shift and kind of try and meet uh, meet uh, this whole uh, whole range of uh, people and activities and see how they can be supported. Uh, I think this is really an opportunity. What is so? The, I mean, uh, this post-COVID uh, situation is an opportunity because what this sector needs is not a huge amount of investment in infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, which the formal economy might need. Uh, they, they basically just need uh, legislative changes. They need uh, more rights. They need more protection. 
and these things don't cost a whole lot of money so uh, if you could actually uh, kind of kick start a local economy i think that, that would be the area to start with because they don't want investments from imf or from from japanese development bank or from anywhere they just want local regulations and local administration to shift and be a little bit more uh, empathetic you know mm -hmm. so uh, this is really the opportunity to 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 make use of you know and uh, they could actually be the be uh, the torch bearers of our of our economic revival mm -hmm. <laughs> and recovery mm -hmm. I mean, by nature they they are far more resilient they are far more resilient than the formal structure i mean mm. because they are and less no, dependent just, on yeah yeah we, we just start thinking about building incubators for the you know for the entrepreneurs the micro entrepreneurs at the bottom of the yeah. pyramid and that's really the road to sustainable and inclusive growth yeah Yeah, I think one of the problems right now is that uh, they, they are running reasonably successful businesses. Uh, they are just a, a large part of their profits are actually going away because they are not the businesses are not entirely legitimate. They are harassed. They are so there is a kind of precarity with the whole uh, precariousness in the whole situation in which they are in. And I, so if those conditions could change, they would be even more profitable. They would actually. probably enrich themselves and move on to to set up even better businesses so uh, oh, it 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 uh, there is a i mean there is a lot a lot to kind of uh, there's a uh, there's good case for people to just uh, accept those businesses and to them and they they will really flourish i mean right now uh, it's a it's a uh, they are they are surviving not flourishing Yes. Yep. I think so. Thank you, Rohit, for that. Um, let's now turn to this um, mega question of the actual cultural identity and role of um, public streets. Now, the cultural sector has been put greatly in peril by the pandemic and uh, is uh, is in a very vulnerable state in many many places. But um, pop culture is another formidable force. and uh, it begs the question of you know how can culture and cultural programs cultural strategies help to revive failing high streets and down at heel town centers in ways that avoid the kind of all too common cookie cutter uniformity perpetuating mm. monocultures i mean india particularly has such a strong uh, cultural heritage of streets uh, richly activity based with festivals celebrations other expressions of community identity um here in the uk i think we've become a little bit too uh, clever at packaging and on more artificial notions of street culture yeah. um you know i think brand culture is responsible for let's say dominating some of that language um a bit too much but uh, mumbai has a wonderful indigenous culture it's the biggest producer of handmade items and so on so how can we make sure that this kind of interdependency in a fruitful way is 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 nurtured between uh, retail and culture uh, and they're not uh, completely separate anyway a lot of artists are very on a very uh, naturally have to be entrepreneurial and uh, and retail is is using cultural languages in very very fertile ways in any case hmm. so adam You have yeah, I mean, you've had a, be a wonderful program of cultural events at Crate over the last over the time. Yeah, we're lucky with the Walthamstow site, the Waltham mm -hmm. Forest site, where it opened during Borough of Culture, London Borough of Culture, as I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, which is the mayor's uh, initiative. A fantastic year of cultural events right way through London Borough of Waltham Forest, and um, and and we um, we hosted. And a number of events throughout the year, whether it was art nights where we had five thousand people come through on a Saturday, um, pride. There was it was an incredible series of events that ran through the site. I think it comes back to again um, from a physical perspective. So from a designer's perspective, 
it's about creating um, the right environments. And those environments don't look like big shiny towers. They look like inclusive, open environments where anyone can walk in, feel welcome, do business, buy, sell, whatever it is. And I think, I think, I think that you know, from a physical perspective, I think we mustn't give up on, on bricks and mortar. Um, you know, I think it is about looking forward. Um, and I think that it's time for institutional landlords, traditional investors to look at, well, they have to, they have to look at their assets. They have to look at the city centers that they own and control and, and take note of change and build less ivory towers, build more inclusive environments for the early adopters, the entrepreneurs, the micro SMEs, the creatives, because that seeds culture, that seeds nightlife, that brings authenticity back into cities. It creates vibrancy, it adds value, it makes places safe. And it brings confidence back into town centres, mm. um, whether it's urban environments or town centres. And you can't buy that and you can't curate that. You know, there's a lot of organic curation goes into stuff like that. Mm. And it's very important that developers and institutions and local authorities nurture it and facilitate it, but don't perhaps try and over, overly control it. Um, so culture events and culture, cultural um a series of cultural curated events uh, are hugely important to the success of any scheme from an operator's perspective. From a local community's perspective, it's imperative because it's their opportunity to come in and get involved, um, whatever it might be, whether it's Chinese New Year, um, various different events that I can think that we've run in the last 12 months on, on, the, on that particular site have been massively inclusive and aimed at Getting the local community into these into these environments, mixing with entrepreneurs, mixing with small businesses, mm. whether they're street food traders or whether they're dressmakers. Yeah, brilliant. Ro Rohit, what are your thoughts on the interdependency uh, in a healthy way between culture and commerce? Uh, I think both are definitely uh, essential for for cities to be to be to be successful. Uh, I think the, the the problem we have been having is that unfortunately there is this uh, understanding that we need to start uh, fabricate culture. I mean, there is there there are branding agencies that are trying to package cities and sell cities. So I think the the key issue here is contextuality, being aware of each city, its history, its geography, where it has come from, and there is a certain uniqueness. Mm. Uh, I think what we have suffered, not I mean the whole globally we have suffered from uh, it has um, the globalization of of capital has happened before the globalization of anything else so uh, so people have created urban projects to attract global capital rather than respond to a contextual demand mm -hmm. and i think we are kind of seeing the the, 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 the the flip side of all that because uh, the demand remains. And if you don't cater to that demand, mm. uh, I mean, you can package products, you can brand product, but they will not sell because they do not cater to the demand. And uh, I, uh, so I think the contextuality is essential even for good commerce. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless your products, uh, whether they are real estate products or, or your urban policies are responding to a local demand, uh, and by that, uh, responding to the local culture as well, uh, uh, they will work. Otherwise, they may seem to work for some, but over a day, it's, it won't be a sustainable uh, situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy, I know that I'm in a city which d does not need to create a shopping festival or something like that. I mean, I have enough festivals. There is enough every streets of Mumbai, and uh, uh, we do not need. Uh, you know, and a, a branding agency to try and sell Mumbai to to to, to as whatever. I mean, uh, there is enough happening here to to, you know, to, to uh, if you don't notice it, then I don't. I mean, I, the problem is not uh, with the city. You know? Yeah, so, uh, I, I think I, the, 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 yeah, yeah, d absolutely. I visited Mumbai once, and 
it's always the maximum city. It's a fantastic place. Yes. yes. Um, it does not deserve yeah, to it's be a great place. Yes. super branded. Of course, that is going to be <laughs> a tendency everywhere, isn't it? Really, wherever such branding. But comes. I think it's, it's. I think it's also a little bit of uh, you know there is a what I would call a global citizenry that mm. expects the same things everywhere. They want the same references. They want the mm. same kind of milestones that kind of and i think that's a pity i mean uh, well, that's a, that's a real pity i mean if uh, uh, i hope uh, the new uh, i mean the post covid world would would be global in terms of exchange of ideas but not mm. necessarily in the exchange of uh, 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 anything else you know yeah right thanks thanks for that you know, you're right, Rohit. I think uh, um, the era that we've previously seen has, you know, focused a ton on capital and globalization and globalization of products. But, you know, the things that won, even during that era, has been authentic local culture. Even if whichever city you would visit as a global citizen, you were looking for the flavor of that place. You were looking for the authentic brands, ideas of that place. So I think uh, we'll s hopefully see that coming back, uh, yeah. the, you know, post COVID era in a bigger way, because that's needed not just for sustainability, but also for a healthier economic future. You know, uh, my next point is that, you know, Rohit in, your, in his report proposes to extend the role of the street vendor to become a community worker with ice on the streets and in a way com combining employment and community service and changing the vendor's status within our communities while adam uh, as an entrepreneur of community retail future aims to shape the development journey and the commercial journey together by ensuring that he, you know, he brings in well-aligned and uh, uh, a well-aligned network of retailers uh, while creating a vibrant, authentic neighborhood that we've just discussed. Rohit, how do you enable uh, in, informal workers in our cities um, as a community to become more collaborative? Uh, and to play that community role uh, within our cities. And how, how do we enable this new generation of uh, street leadership and ecosystem? What are the approaches we can take to, uh, you know, make that vision come alive? Hmm. No, I think in many ways they they are already playing that role. I mean, they have not been recognized uh, about playing that role. They have not been given due credit, but they are already playing that role. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, the Mumbai police will tell you that uh, a lot of informers are actually street vendors. <laughs> you know, so, so, uh, so they are, and also in terms of safety. I mean, I remember uh, uh, when uh, my son was much younger, he was unwell and he didn't go to school, and um, asked. Me, you know, I didn't see your son for the last two days. Uh, is he not well? So that is the kind of uh, uh, presence and uh, kind of social uh, network they are part of. And, uh, I think the it it is not a big shift for them to 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 uh, to be to become community uh, workers. I think they already are. Uh, I think uh, it's the other way around. I think the communities have to recognize that role and uh, give them that due space and respect for that. Uh, uh, it's, it's a long, it's a long, uh, long process. I don't think it will happen immediately because these are uh, changes of mindsets. Uh, and uh, uh, if there's one thing I've learned uh, during, I mean, my interaction with the city authorities that one has to be extremely patient i mean even this national act for street vending uh, it came it became a national act in i mean it was drafted in 2009 and it was accepted in the parliament in 2013 and the whole process started with one vendor taking the 
Delhi Municip municipal authorities to court because he was evicted from his uh, street vending business in 1989. So it took almost 25 years for one court case to really become a national law. So, uh, so if there's one thing I've learned is that one has to be extremely patient. Whatever changes, uh, I think we are moving in the right direction, but maybe not fast enough, but still we're moving in that direction. The, the, the kind of changes this demands is, is, uh, is quite complex. Uh, there are changes in administrative structures, changes in political organization, changes even in the way uh, there are street unions, I mean, there are unions of street vendors, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But even in the way they are organized, they are probably not ready for change. They are just looking at survival rather than actually uh, uh, going ahead and becoming more uh, uh, more uh, significant in the whole uh, economic uh, and, uh, fabric of the city. You know? Anand, what about you? Um, you know, how do you go about creating this ecosystem of diverse and creative uh, community of uh, uh, entrepreneurs or retailers um, and also ensure that they become stewards of that place? Well, I think it's um, interesting in a, in a meanwhile scheme where you've got early adopters, as we call them, you know, the, the worker ants that are going very early, often into um, quite difficult landscapes, um, sensitive landscapes where there's disenfranchisement in the local community for whatever reason. Um, and I think that actually, I think it's a very, very interesting point that, um, that, uh, that, that these micro SMEs, these entrepreneurs, they almost immediately stitch into the local community, both physically and digitally. Um, and and it's, it's it's very prevalent. You've got a site that's um, that's open to the public, open to the local local community. So much so that he, anyone from any background can come into any of our sites. And if if they can't, I want to know why. And I and, and I think you know that comes down to to the people in the sites. You know, place making is 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 is. is, 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 is is a interesting word. Um, people make places. Buildings facilitate the physical piece, facilitates the people, but the people create the place. And um, and and I, I think now more than ever, the physical interaction between human beings, um, and uh, with with the rise and and, and of, of, of digital, and the ability to utilize that digital power to stitch even further into local communities so both physically and digitally small businesses entrepreneurs street traders whatever you want to call them they are massively important when it comes to creating community and re reuniting and regenerating community as well adam you're right i think uh, as we're all locked up within our homes and living in this digital public square, we are, um, you know, we, we are really craving our local communities. And I think uh, we're going to support them a lot more, uh, you know, post COVID era. And at this moment, I want to say hello to the digital public square and the community that is joining us on various platforms. Um, and Facebook pages. Uh, hello, everyone. Please feel free to ask us uh, questions in the video box below or leave your comments as well. Lucy? Okay, well, while we're waiting for the rustling up the questions, um, I've got a quick one as a final one from me and me and Prathima. So, um, this whole uh, adaptation that we've uh, that that many streets in cities across the world have made, um, or let's say the local municipalities have made, uh, very very deftly adapting streets to make them more walkable and more cyclable in many places. It begs the question of uh, the argument for creating more adaptable infrastructures to support retail as we come out of this. Uh, you know, like new covered market structures, 
uh, together with soft programming activities like cooking schools. What kind of specific proposition would you make to, let's say, your local mayor, your local uh, municipal leader right now for um, making it easier for policy to, um, to, to bring on board quickly new infrastructures? Because there are limitations and there are restrictions to, uh, to planning at the moment. That, that perhaps, you know, in the next couple of years, we're going to need different tactics to deal with this. Tactical urbanism is now much more important than ever before. So maybe yeah. Adam first. Brilliant. Well, I think, I think from my perspective, really quickly, it's, it's, it's conception of idea, bring everyone together in a room, stakeholders, community, um, to shape the vision. And for me, that's elemental. Um, if, if the stakeholders don't feel engaged, if, if, you, if you can engage everyone from the beginning and they really buy in to the, the idea and they have a, a sense of ownership, um, I think that's really important. And to get the job done, I think, um, I think everyone needs to have an I did that attitude, whether it's the the overworked planning teams. Mm. Uh, I can, you know, I can talk about planning teams in the UK. They're massively overstretched in all the local forests I, I talk to. They work very hard. Mm. And they work very hard to adapt for these challenging times. Um, it's about sense of ownership. It's about being transparent, and it's about everyone buying into the vision and shaping the vision from the off. Mm. If you go in and you tell someone what you're going to do, I wouldn't blame them if they push back. Mm. You know, um, so I've always believed in, in, in that, and I think more now than ever, there needs to be this, um, this, 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 this collaboration piece that is, that is everyone buys in. Fantastic. And Ro Rohit, on the tactical urbanism, maybe some influence that you can place on local municipal leaders to accommodate things. Actually, he, fast. here we are. We are in a phase where there's a lot of heavy infrastructure being built in our cities. I mean, yeah. our cities are building metro, metro lines, they're building expressways, etc., etc., etc. And uh, rail, I mean, uh, big, large transit hubs are uh, coming, are going to be transformed in the next uh, uh, half a decade or a decade. Uh, what I would want to tell our uh, uh, administration is that to be aware of, uh, of of the local context. Don't just uh, uh, go by some uh, you know, uh, uh, standard typologies of, uh, say, transit hubs, which may work elsewhere in the world. Uh, 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 be aware of the local economy. Be aware of the local uh, demographics. How uh, how our markets work. How I mean, markets in all sense of, of, of the word. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, try and make sure that uh, we don't uh, kind of create projects that do not fit in. And, uh, uh, because unlike maybe uh, you know the, the developed economies, we, our cities are actually building their basic infrastructure right now. Mumbai metro lines are being constructed right now. Yeah. So yeah. I think it would, it would be very useful if people uh, do integrate uh, uh, micro entrepreneurs, uh, street vendors, all kinds of other other uh, activities. I mean, I remember as a kid, I have seen even acrobats on the streets of Mumbai. I mean, I don't see them anymore because uh, the streets are not friendly anymore for that. Uh, so this, this is, it's a loss. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge cultural loss. And uh, yeah. hopefully we, we will stop these kind of losses and hopefully we'll be able to uh, not just protect them but also make them make them our uh, make them our uh, uh, you know mascots i mean uh, this is what mumbai is yeah yeah <laughs> yeah endless endlessly creative definitely <laughs> thank you you know as we come close to uh, wrapping up the session i want to ask both of you for a quick advice to all the entrepreneurs, architects, and urbanists who are joining us, if you had one piece of advice uh, to uh, advance and enable this field further, what would it be? 
Adam? Mm. Don't give up on bricks and mortar. That's the word I would say. Yeah. Don't give up on it. Um, yeah. You know, it's inevitable that there's going to be less physical. Um, um, it's inevitable there's going to be more digital. I read, um, I'm reading an interesting book actually, a bit of a shout out. It's um, Reimagining Retail, I'm sure if you're allowed to plug books by Doug Stevens. Re, re, re engineer retail, even and uh, yeah. imagining on the brain. And uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really good book, it's really made me think differently about things. And there's a line in there, and he calls it digital, <laughs> it's blending physical and digital. So, in my world of retail mixed use, I think it would be great to see more integration of digital <laughs> and read that book because it's brilliant. <laughs> Rohit? Uh, I would say uh, uh, be extremely patient. Don't have too many uh, assurances. Be resilient. Be open to ideas. Uh, uh, and patience. I mean, especially in the Indian context. I mean, things uh, do work, but they work slowly. And, and it's not such a bad thing that things work slowly because uh, generally things that work fast uh, need not necessarily be the right ones. So I think uh, uh, I would agree with Adam in a sense. There is there is still a lot to be achieved in the brick and mortar. It's not that we have uh, we have got it all right. Uh, uh, the digital is going to add new dimensions. Uh, and I also feel after uh, the whole experience of the past few months, people would actually uh crave for what the digital cannot offer uh they would probably start valuing the the uh, uh, the non digital things <laughs> and the kind of uh, uh, uncertainties and surprises that uh, that are there in the physical world which are probably not uh, I mean, the digital world, for all you, whatever you say, is still extremely curated. It's somebody else's vision that you are, mm. you are experiencing. And uh, I hope that uh, people do realize that. I mean, I already see a difference because I'm also teaching. I already see a difference between the students I had, say, 15, 20 years ago and the students I have now. Uh, there is a certain poverty of experience, of of personal experience. Uh, and I think the digital exposure is partly responsible for that. There is a kind of uniformity of experience amongst the students. Mm. And I hope that people realize the, 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 the value of, uh, of the non-digital. <laughs> and the cities are, are the best expression of that value. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> No, this was such an amazing and rich conversation. I want to thank both of you for uh, joining us today uh, on this important agenda um, that really has to be the foundation for the road to recovery. Mm. Mm. And I will invite all of you to continue to join our Urban Manifesto series. Um, every Tuesday, uh, 4.30 p.m. London time, 9 p.m. India time, and 11.30 a.m. Um, New York time, right? So we'd love to uh, have all of your thoughts also on, you know, the major agendas we should have for our urban futures. Um, do join us next week as we debate one of the most contested ideas of urbanism, uh, which is about the future of density. And we are uh, thrilled to have an uh, uh, icon of livable urban density, uh, the uh, director of planning, uh, former director of planning at Vancouver, Larry Beasley, who's uh, known for this whole phenomena called uh, Vancouverism, which combines livability with uh, uh, high density. And we also have uh, best-selling author Anna Minton, uh, who 
wrote one of those iconic books uh, on big capital who is london for so it, it you know it promises to be a very vibrant discussion so please do continue uh, to join us and do share your agenda for what our urban manifesto should be as we uh, think about uh, moving ahead into the new era post covid thank you again for joining us thank you adam and rohit uh, for this very important conversation thank you thank you thank you very